scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel 10, 1 through 10, and 20 through 26. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelzah on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, The donkeys you set out to look for have been found. And now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will prophesy. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon them, and he joined them in prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Verses 20 through 26. When Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribes of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Jim Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matra's clan was taken. Finally Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and brought him out, and he stood among the people as, a, as he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king. Samuel explained to the people the rights and the duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited them there before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. The word of God for the people. Thanks be to God. taken from this text that Belinda read and we've all looked at nature from time to time and marveled at how God created everything. We see in God's sovereignty how he chose to place everything, the stars, the planets, you and me. He placed us all in time and space. In the New Testament we read that God chose a band of simple men to spread his word. But it wasn't just the apostles. Actually, when it came time to spread the word to the entire world, the apostles are the ones who stayed back in Jerusalem. Guess who it was that 
spread out and spread the word. It was the laity. It was God's people. It was not the apostles. God chose a respected rabbi and a leader of the Jews to become an itinerant preacher of the gospel and reach the Gentiles. His name was Paul. He wrote about a third of the New Testament and uh, he had a tremendous shift in his mind and in his life, did he not, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Snap it down a little bit further to modern times. God chose a man by the name of Billy Graham to wake up the religious world and the world that wasn't so religious. When we say that God is sovereign, it means that he's in charge. You know what a sovereign is? Sovereign is a ruler. Sovereign is somebody who, when he says do this, you don't say why, you say how high do you want me to jump? God chooses. And in some cases, he chooses in a way that confuses. <laughs> And he makes us wonder why he chose this way or that. First Samuel 10, that story that Belinda read for us, the story of Saul, it's a story of a hometown boy who was chosen as the first king of Israel. This is a story of a local hero who's chosen by God and anointed by the prophet Samuel to be at the head of the history of God's chosen people. Why did he do that? Why did God choose somebody like Saul? Well, two questions always come up in my mind when I read this. It's not so much why did he choose Saul, it's why would he ever choose somebody like me? Have you never thought that? You've never been humbled by being in the presence of God. Because how in the world could God put up with somebody like Russell? The questions that come up in my mind whenever I read this passage about Saul, first is, how does somebody go about the business of being the kind of person that God uses? That question always pops up in my mind. What are the qualities that God looks for when he's picking somebody to do something for him? Second question that always comes up is, how can a person of God be used where it counts the most? In other words, we may sense that God wants us to do something, and we may have a struggle with, well, what is it that you want me to do? But even more so, where do you want me to do it? Our text, I think, demonstrates the way God dealt with this one man, Saul, to use him in leading his nation. So I want to give you four things to notice about this text and apply to our own lives. I have, throughout the years, had to grapple with each one of these that we'll talk about this morning. First of all, note that Samuel was the prophet and Saul was the one who was picked. He was picked by God. Verse 1 of our text says that Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head, kissed him, and he said, The Lord has anointed you ruler over his people Israel. You shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies all around. Now this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you ruler over his heritage. That's the first part of the story. Saul had been busy minding his own business. He was working for his father. He was minding the business of running down some stray mules for his father when all of this happened. When Samuel saw Saul on the road and God put it in Samuel's heart and his mind that this was the one to be anointed as king. It was the prophet's job back then to anoint the next king. So he did that and from Saul's viewpoint it must have seemed like God picked him at random because it was such a surprise to him. Matter of fact when it came time for the official choosing in front of everybody else Saul was hiding. He thought certainly Samuel had made a mistake. But it's in God's economy that we're studying this here, and in God's economy there are no surprises. 
God is never surprised by anything that happens. It's like that today, here in this service. Every one of us that is here today has a, there's a reason that God had to have us here today. We're all here by design. There is a purpose that God has in mind for each of us. God chooses. He picks people to do things for him just as certainly as he picked Saul to do his will. A second thing that we need to notice here is that Saul was not only picked by God, he was prepared for service. Yes, I'm using alliteration this morning. He was picked, he was prepared. There'll be two more Ps, all right? He was prepared for serving. Samuel told Saul, this is where you need to go. You need to go to this place here, and this is what's going to happen as you go along the road. You're going to meet some people, and in the process, some things are going to happen, and it's okay. You need to just go with this flow. That's an updated version of the King James, if you understand. And Saul did meet the men that he was supposed to meet, and he worshipped with them, and God's Spirit got a hold of this newly anointed king. Don't forget the, don't forget the sequence here. Samuel, in private, anoints Saul as king. Nobody's watching. It's just between the two of them. And he gives him some instructions. You go here because God's going to prepare you. And he meets these men that are coming down the road. And everything that God, that Samuel said to Saul was going to happen with these men that he's going to meet, it will happen. Everything that Samuel said would happen, happened. I think you can be certain that when God picks you, he's going to prepare you for whatever his work demands. There's a very sound principle in view here. God predicted all sorts of things about Saul through the prophet Samuel, but those things all came about because Saul's heart was changed. And he met those men, and he worshipped with those men, and they go unnamed in Scripture. We don't know who they were, but Samuel knew that they'd be there, and Saul actually met them. And they worshiped together, and things happened, and Saul's heart melted, and God gave him a new heart. That's what it says in the scripture. God predicted all sorts of things about Saul through this prophet, but those things came about because Saul's heart was changed, and he cooperated with God. Did you know that God will never force you to do his will? He'll never force you to join a church. He'll never force you to accept Christ as your Savior. He'll never force you into doing things. Now, he may make the circumstances really clear to you in ways that you think you're being coerced. But listen, God is who he is. He's sovereign. God picks us. But I think we all must, in some way, take part in preparing to do his will. That begs a question for each one of us. How diligently are each of us preparing to do God's bidding. How diligently do we prepare to work for God? Saul was picked by God. Secondly, he was prepared by God for serving. And thirdly, he was positioned by God for maximum effect. The story continues here with Samuel calling all of the nation of Israel together to announce that God had chosen a new king. Uh, Actually, the first king. He was the first king of Israel. Uh, there had been an anointing in private. It was time to make it public. Saul had had his heart changed. Now here he is. He's standing in front of all the witnesses. And Saul, Saul is chosen by all things of lottery. Now, I have not preached my lottery sermon here. But I'll let you know where I stand. <coughs> it ain't good. It's oppressive to the poor. All right, I won't get off on that. That's, that's a 45-minute sermon in itself. If you want, I'll mail you a copy. All right? But in front of all these witnesses, Saul is chosen by lottery. And it's done much the same as we would flip a coin. Literally, that's what... Samuel had to do in this process. Now understand, remember the sequence. Saul anoints 
Samuel, uh, Samuel announced, why couldn't they, why do they have to have the same first one? <laughs> Samuel anoints Saul before all of, all of this. It's in private. Then he has this meeting. His heart has changed. Now Samuel calls all the people of Israel together. How many people? Millions. Okay, they weren't all there that day, I'm sure. But all of the representatives was representatives from all the families. And this is done much like we would flip a coin. The odds were at least as great as winning the North Carolina lottery. If you buy one ticket, how many billions of odds against you are there? Many, <coughs> right? There's only one or two or three or four winners who pick that long number, right? So this is very interesting, the way that they did this. <coughs> you would almost think it was just um, absolute chance, but... I want to tell you, the sequence says it all. Samuel has already anointed Saul. Saul knows that this has to happen. But Samuel, now in front of all this great gathering, is going to pick the new king. And he's going to do it by flipping the coins. They called them the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, those are two Hebrew words. And those were the names of the coins, the holy coins, if you will. Prophet would stand there and ask God a question. Oh God, is it of the 12 tribes, is it the tribe of Judah? And then he would flip the two coins. Now the two coins, the two stones, they were white on one side and black on the other side. So you have white and black, white and black, two coins. And he would flip them. And the idea was this, he would ask the question first. And as the coins landed, everybody would take a look and see. If the two white sides were up, that was a yes. The two black sides were down, that was a no. Anything other, where one is white and the other is black, didn't count. They'd have to flip them again. So, in the process, Samuel starts off with the tribes. How many tribes were there? Twelve tribes. Just getting a yes answer on a tribe was quite a matter of odds, wasn't it? But going past the tribes, once he settled on the tribe of Benjamin, I mean, if the coins matched, it was God's answer yes, right? If not, then the next tribe had to be questioned. He went on until he got to the tribe of Benjamin. When he flipped the coins, they both came up white, which means... That was his choice. So it was the tribe of Benjamin. What tribe did Saul belong to? Benjamin. Benjamin. Now if you go all the way down the line from the tribes, he goes to the families. From the families, he goes to the members of the family. And from each member of the family, he would ask the question. He eliminated all the families of the tribe down to Kish, who's Saul's father, and then all the members of the family down to Saul. Flipping the coins all the time. The odds that the two coins each time would choose towards Saul, narrowing it down. Whereas in the previous selection process, which was private, he started the other way around. He saw Saul and he said, you're it. This process was letting the people know that this is the way, this is the one God really had chosen. The odds that each time those coins were flipped would work out so that in the end they got from the tribes to the families, all the members of the families, all the sons down to one family, one son in that family. The odds are in the billions, maybe even trillions. I didn't do the math. I'm not that good. But in this way, God positioned Saul. He made sure that among all of this process, where theoretically anybody in the land could have been king, right? In this way, God positions Saul in front of all of Israel to be their king, to do the very thing that God wanted. Now, there's no mistake about where God places us. He knows what we are capable of. He knows what he wants done at any given time. So, don't ever forget 
that when God picks and prepares you for his work, the position, what was Saul's position again? It was king, right? The position that God places you in, like Saul, is the most important, the biggest priority of your life. Why did I go through all of that, that whole process? Why did I talk about that to you? It's because God is picking you. <coughs> if that were not so, you wouldn't be breathing. Everybody who's still breathing has a purpose that God is picking for them. And if he's picked you and prepared you and positioned you, he expects you to be profitable. And verses 25 through 27 in that text that uh, Belinda read a moment ago demonstrates how not to get sidetracked when you're going after this purpose that God has given you. Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship. All laid out. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. We have that in Scripture. Then Samuel sent all the people back to their homes. When Saul returned to his home at Gibeah, a group of men... Now listen, here's where it gets really interesting. This is how not to get sidetracked, folks, off of the purpose that God is leading you into. When Saul returned to his home at Gibeah, a group of men whose hearts God had touched went with him. But, here comes the sidetrack, there were some scoundrels who complained. How can this man save us? And they scorned him and refused to bring him gifts. But, Saul ignored them. Say that with me. Saul ignored them. Anytime you try to do something in ministry to the Lord, in response to him, in obedience to him, for his kingdom, maybe it's to lead a child to Christ, maybe it's to pastor a church, maybe it's to be in the legislature, <laughs> work for God there, maybe it's as a plumber to be a Christian plumber. What comes first in the two words Christian and plumber? You are a Christian who happens to be a plumber, not a plumber who happens to be a Christian. There's a difference. There's a difference. One is intentionality. The difference is intentionality. You do your plumbing because you're going to meet people, and you're going to meet people who don't know Christ, or people who are knowing Christ, but their faith is wavering, and you're going to shore it up for them. You see what I'm saying? No matter where God leads you, no matter what you do, for a vocation, or where you travel for vacation, or what you may do in the grocery store to bring groceries home, or uh, how you drive your car. Oh my goodness, that's, a, that's another one. <laughs> you are representing God because He picked you for what you're doing. Saul was picked, he was prepared, he was positioned by God, and some troublemakers just couldn't handle that. But Saul committed himself to being profitable where the Lord had positioned him. That is the key to that. How can you be a person that God will use? You commit. You say, God, I will be the person you want me to be. God, I will be what Scripture tells me to be because that's what you want for me. And I'll do it wherever you lead. Bottom line, I'd like to say that Saul finished well because he didn't. I'd like to be able to say that, but he didn't. He gave up on serving God in God's way, and God dealt with him. However, the start that he made, and the failure that eventually defeated Saul, you know what that does? It makes, it, it makes Saul really more human to us. He isn't just removed. He sees, or we see, how he failed. We understand that because we share the same experience. We don't always have success in everything we try to do, whether it's for ourselves or for God, but especially for God. I can look back on years and years of ministry and say, boy, I would do that different. Oh, man, I would do that. Oh, man, I would not have done that. Knowing what I know now, you know.
but it teaches us some things. It teaches us that we can also be used no matter how bad we may have messed things up or how we think we might mess things up. We can be used, and God is picking each one of us, trust me. It also teaches us about simple things that will cause you to stumble in life. So it is good to read this story. So whatever work that God has chosen you to do, there are going to be some people that are going to have their hearts touched by God and they are going to join in and help. I want to tell you that I experienced that here in this church. We've been together about 10 months now and all I can tell you is that Elizabeth and I have enjoyed being here so much because we have seen hearts that are touched for the Lord. Hearts that jump in and help. Hearts that are not afraid. Hearts that are soft. So never worry about criticism. Just look around at the blessings. What is it that touches Russell's heart? Well, my heart is touched when I see folks getting saved. When I see them obedient in baptism and church membership and coming in and building the house and the kingdom of God. My heart is touched when I see rededicated hearts begin to serve God in sincerity and love. My heart weeps for joy when there's holy giving and holy going in the name of Jesus. And my heart just absolutely melts like Saul's must have when I see people dwelling in unity like Canaan and first, joining their hearts together and working hard for the kingdom of God. Theology according to Maud. Maud Rothrock was in the church that I served, the last Baptist church that I served. She talked about the church that we were serving. Her husband started that church, and uh, he had long since gone. Otherwise, he still would have been pastor, and I never would have. I asked Maud one time, I said, Maud, how did this church you know, build these buildings, and how did it all come about and you know I asked her to share some of the history with me she said the people had a heart for God and they worked like Turks <laughs> simple as that I guess so what is it that touches your heart I know one thing for sure what touches your heart can be God's heart if you'll offer yours to him in the name of the Father be cooperating with the Spirit to honor the Son. Amen. Our